This webinar is made possible by the CAF. If you'd like to support our mission to educate, inspire, and honor, please visit our website at commemorativeairforce.org. There you can donate, uh, you can support our educational programs or our flying aircraft, or you can join us as a CAF member. I'm your host, Steve Bos, and we're glad that you could join us tonight. Remember, if you have any questions during our presentation, just type them in the chat box, and we'll save time at the end of the presentation uh, to have those questions answered. Now, joining me tonight are Susan Jansen Nickerson and Sherry Simmons-Green, who will talk about the book Surviving Hitler, Evading Stalin. It's a memoir of Susan's mother, Mildred Schindler Jansen. And ladies, uh, good evening, and, and welcome to the show. Thank you. Good evening. Well, just briefly, uh, just give us a little overview of what uh, the, the time frame is that, that we uh, cover in the book. The book starts um, in the early years of the war, about 1938-39, and um, goes there. Mildred actually had been born in the United States, and Susan, I'll let you take that. <laughs> Sure. She was born in the United States and uh, about six months uh, after she was born, her uh, father got a message that his mother had passed away and he was needed back in Germany to run the family farm. And that was a, a tough decision for he and my grandmother to make because they both came over from Germany and really enjoyed living in the United States, but they they made the decision to go back. And so when my mom was six months old, they went back to Germany. And so she grew up there um, as as a German citizen, not not really knowing the significance of the fact that she was born in the United States. Awesome. In in this this memoir, now uh, your mom is is ninety two years old, um, but why did she decide to write the story now? What was the, the impetus that that brought her to to share her her story today? Well, that's a, a question we get all the time, and uh, she started writing the story down about four years ago when she was eighty eight, and um, at that time. Uh, you know, she had shared the story with many groups over the course of her life. You know, when when she got to the United States and learned English, she she spoke at groups, uh, organizations, civic clubs, uh, classrooms, and there were also a number of articles that were written about her life and her experiences, uh, dozens and dozens of newspaper and magazine and newsletter articles, and interviews uh, for the church paper. And so, you know, her, her story was never a secret, but she had never written it down. And she got motivated um, after all those years because she wanted her grandchildren, her children, her grandchildren, and her great-grandchildren to know her story. And she also wanted them to understand the truth about the war um, and understand why she was so proud to be an American and who, uh, someone who appreciates her, her freedom more, uh, having lived through the oppression of Hitler, uh, uh, Hitler's Nazi Germany and uh, Stalin's Red Army. So her goal was to share her story and to share the message. So, and also, she did. You know, she doesn't want history to repeat itself, and she's very concerned and worried about um, history repeating itself. Uh, looking at the landscape now, and she feels like she can see the same signs that she saw back in Germany when their freedoms were slowly taken away and many citizens ended up displaced and, and as you know, many of them died. So it, it was a really hard undertaking for her and you know, she decided to tell the story one more time uh, from beginning to end and we, we now have a book, Surviving Hitler, Evading Stalin, One Woman's Remarkable Escape from Nazi Germany, and it's in Kindle version, and it's an audiobook. But um, she was she was very 
brave and courageous to do the hard work it took to retell the story again and recalling all those experiences gave her nightmares but she was determined to see it through and in the end there, there was I think 11 hours of interview uh, video and hundreds of questions answered and four manuscript reviews which we had no idea that was going to be part of our responsibility but we wanted to make sure everything was correct and so uh, it, was a, it was a large undertaking but uh, she's happy she did it and she's very glad that that her story is now um in you know in a, a wonderful format that that sherry so graciously helped us uh, with and and wove the history in and and we feel like you know we've got a, we've had a lot of good feedback and we're uh, mom mom is very happy with the product so so that's why she decided to uh, uh, to write it after all these years to share it with the grandchildren and share it with the world and so history does not repeat itself. Well, and that, that writing the story is one thing, but then also uh, bringing in someone like Sherry to help craft the story uh, and and make sure that it's uh, it's ready to be presented to the to the uh, to the world. And and uh, Sherry, uh, welcome uh, again. And and uh, how did you get involved in this project? You in Mississippi and uh, Mildred in Kansas. Well, the story actually starts year be years before I ever met Susan and her mother but I was teaching in the year 2006 at um, Jackson Preparatory School, the, the high school where I had actually gone to school and our two children were there, but was a history teacher and decided to go back um, to graduate school and get a master's in history. Actually was a marketing um, major in under, undergrad at Mississippi State. And so education was a second career and um, was in grad school from 2006 to 2010. And when I graduated, my mother um, kindly invited me to go with her on a trip to Europe. We did a Trafalgar tour, Sound of Music tour, and went to Southern Germany and to Austria. And so we left in late May and we, I think we flew into Vienna and then met the tour there. And the very first night, after dinner and then we met in a meeting room and met our um, guide Ingrid and all the other men and women that were on the tour with us. I met this lovely lady from Lyons, Kansas, Jean Binky, who was Mildred's cousin, Mildred's husband's cousin. And so we just hit it off. The tour was about 10 days and she was with some lady friends. Her husband was not able to come on the trip, but my mother and I and Jean and her friends spent a lot of time together. Um, she was a retired history teacher. I was still in the classroom. We both loved to read. Um, we both were followers of Christ and shared that. We just had a lot in common. And so when the tour ended, we exchanged um, contact information with each other. And in the 10 years after that, we have just kept in touch with each other all these years. And in January of 2019, I called her because I was writing a magazine article about our tour guide, Ingrid, um, who, when we got to Dachau concentration camp there on the outskirts of Munich, that was the very last stop on the tour. And I just happened to be standing by Ingrid as she got off the bus. And I can she was a beautiful older lady with beautiful blonde hair, brilliant blue eyes, and just kind of running her hand through her hair like she was very upset. And she said, I'm going in there today. And I remember thinking, don't you go in there all the time? This is the last stop on this tour and you're the guide. But she said that her father had been... Um, they think kidnapped by the Nazis. She was Austrian and her father had been a, an attorney and not a Nazi sympathizer, but her family, he, um, her father got up and left for work one morning and never came back again. Ingrid was about six, but she just said, this is where she always felt like her father had been incarcerated. And she said, I'm going in there today, but I just, that was one of the most courageous things I've ever witnessed in my life. Anyway, I was writing an article about that, but it called Jean. And in the midst of our conversation, she said, well, my um, 
cousin of mine um, through marriage, Mildred Schindler Jansen, is a World War II survivor and has a really remarkable story. And I remember, I think, even writing Mildred's name down, but I, I made some notes from the conversation, but it never went any further than that. And then unbeknownst to me, in May of that year, um, the subject came up at an extended family gathering and Jean gave my name to Susan's sister, Karen. And then it wasn't until August of that year that they contacted me and kind of the rest, as they say, is history. It's a, it's a, sometimes a very small world, isn't it? When you, when you yeah. think of the connections that, that just sort of happen randomly, but maybe they do happen for a reason. Now, uh, Sherry, you've written a, a number of, uh, like you said, the articles, uh, books and things, but this was the first time you, you did a memoir. How did you, as an author, decide to, to put together a plan to, to, uh, to write the memoir? Well, there were several things. Uh, first of all, obviously tried to learn all I could about Mildred. Um, soon after Susan contacted me two years ago, she was kind enough to send me a huge packet of photocopies of a lot of these newspaper articles that have been written about her mother. And those really provided me just sort of my first introduction to her. Um, also sent, I think Susan, I think it was like 64 questions that I sent to Mildred um, between the time that Susan and I started talking in my trip in October of that year, that Susan was so sweet to scribe um, and then send those answers back. Then I was able to go to Kansas in October of that year and spent five days. And Susan put together a wonderful um, schedule for us um, that was one, you know, so many wonderful people to meet. And then, um, there were some other family members I wasn't able to meet. We did some email correspondence and more questions. And then there were also, there are over 130 original photographs and documents that accompany the text of the book. And so I had access to all of those. Also tried to learn as much as I could about this period of World War history. I've taught American history for years and in fact the World War II period is one of my two favorite time periods um, in history the other being the Civil War but I'd never looked at this niche of the war which really begins on February 1st of 1945 three months right before the fall of Berlin and the end of the war and so um, what I would do is take the historical events that Mildred mentioned that had meant something to her or to her family and then tried to flesh out more details about those. Um, read a lot of World War II related books very quickly, watched a lot of documentaries. I also sought advice from a lot of several writers, in fact, who had written memoir. Um, author Ken Geyer, who very graciously wrote the foreword to the book, has been a friend for several years, and a book he had written in 2015, All the Gallant Men, was one I came upon that fall that was written about Mr. Donald Stratton, who was one of the last five survivors of the sinking of the USS Arizona at Pearl Harbor. Um, but Ken's advice was invaluable. I also studied that book to sort of see how it was constructed and how the different parts were put together. And then Joe Lee, that's an owner and editor of, a, of Dogwood Press here in Mississippi, was another wonderful source of information. Also, we wrote a book proposal for Susan and her family. Again, I had never done this before. I don't know if it was right or wrong, but it worked but did the research and then wrote the book proposal and then sat down to write the book. But in writing the book proposal, um, probably in November and early December of 2019, I had to produce a table of contents and chapter summaries and also write three chapters. So I wrote the preface, chapter one and chapter six, but then that table of contents kind of became my um, trail of breadcrumbs, so to speak, to follow. Um, Mildred's original first person account of the book was right at 4,100 words. The completed manuscript was about 81,000 words. Um, and I spent 732 hours and 43 minutes uh, researching and writing the book. So um, a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun, a lot of fun.
I can tell by the enthusiasm that, that you have. Susan, what was it like when you received uh, Sherry's proposal? I mean, that was, you, you knew the story, you had read what your mother had written, but now this is coming back from a, a third party. What was, what was your reaction, your mother's reaction? Well, it was very exciting to see words on paper and Sherry's ability to, to speak with my mom's voice was incredible. And the way, the way she was able to not only talk for my mother in words, but, but weave the history in that my mother may not have known or that, that was pertinent at the time that would, that would provide context for what my mom was going through at the time was really, was really stunning. We were very excited to have the proposal so that we could get started uh, sending them or sending information to publishers and to see you know if if there would be interest in publishing the book and we had very early success and we were very surprised and very excited by Sunbury's uh, offer of the contract to publish the book. That's awesome. Um, uh, Sherry, you'd mentioned the research that you did. Um, one of our uh, viewers actually sent in a question said, asking, how did, you, uh, how did you take care of the conflict between maybe what, what was in a uh, builder's memory versus what actually happened or even you know, historical uh, inaccuracies that, that happened depending on what text you're, you're using for, for reference? How did you balance all of that? Well, um, um... There were a couple of things from those newspaper articles that she had remembered. Um, maybe a name, I know that, for instance, the ship that brings her to the United States from Germany is the SS Marine Marlin. But I think in one of the early articles where she recalls that, um, she called it the Marine Flasher. So some of those details had been mixed up, but just kind of, typing in words in the internet and just till I, you know, found what I could. Um, also tried to make sure I used reputable sources. Um, having been a school teacher and having had helped young people write papers or do projects, um, had a little bit of feel, I think, for what was con considered, say, um, a reputable source online. Um, that kind of thing, but also found very quickly a great um, collection of books that provided for me um, a lot of that background information. What what helped you write in in Mildred's voice? Um, well, I think mainly having to you know have having met her and spent that time. I also, the family had shared with me several video recorded um, interviews with her, one from the late 1990s that I could go back and replay. I also had access, we had 11 hours of recorded interviews from those days I was with her in Kansas. But that was really one of my goals when I sat down to write the book. I wanted the reader to feel like they were sitting down, he or she um, next to Mildred over a cup of coffee and just listening to her tell her story. And I tried to write in a very conversational style especially those interview recordings and also just notes. I remember those days at Mildred's house as the video recorder was running. I was also writing furiously, um, trying to take notes. I just, that's the way I learn best is to write as I listen. Um, but studying her speech patterns, um, again, those newspaper articles that the family had kept, those were wonderful ways to go sort of back in time with her because the earliest of those was written in 1948 and that would have only been a year or maybe six months after her arrival back in the United States as a teenager. Um, and then also every time I would write a chapter, um, I probably group them together in maybe groups of five, we call them bundles, <laughs> but I would send those, I would send a bundle of chapters to Susan and then she would forward it on to her sister Karen who lives with her mother and they would edit it. So Mildred was seeing everything that was written and 
usually every couple of days or so, I would get an email from either Karen or Susan and they say, you need to change this word. Mildred would not use that. And so um, that was also very helpful knowing that she was reading everything I was writing and, you know, and made sure that again, we didn't list any of the information incorrectly, um, but especially wanted it to sound like it was her voice. Well, and important to note is that uh, she is still uh, going strong at 92. In fact, she's uh, she was going to be on the webinar with us, but a previous engagement, she's uh, speaking at her church tonight, or she has some church activities. But um, Susan, your mom is still very active, and I, that must have, I, I, I guess we, we'll have to ask her in a follow-up, but I mean, I wonder what that was like for her to read her uh, words coming back to her in 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 Sherry's uh, writing, uh, telling her story, and then she's reading her own story. So that must have been a, a fascinating uh, event. I, I believe she enjoyed it. I wasn't there all the time when she was reading it, but uh, she she would pick up on things that weren't quite right, and we would we would get that corrected and. She would say, "Yeah, that that's how it was, you know." And so I I think she was she was very um, honored that it was being written so much better than you know her first rough draft, and um, you know it, it sounded like her voice. You know, it was it was her story, um, but better than she could write it. So I I feel like she was. She was very excited to participate in the process and very thankful to Sherry for all the hard work that she had done to pull everything together. Well, Sherry, uh, you know, we've, we've talked about the, the book and the process and everything, but it all sounds very positive so far, but there must have been some passages or, or things that were more difficult to write in that in that book what what would be something that that was uh, a little more difficult for you to, to get through one of the um, descriptions that was hard for me was to describe bread making and I've made homemade bread before but not the way that Mildred's mother Muti would have made it um, in a in a brick oven that was probably close to the size of maybe half a room in a kitchen. But again, I mentioned earlier a, a videotape that I would have, um, that the family had given me access to of interviews. It was Mildred and also her brother Horst before his death that were interviewed by a lady in Kansas. And both of them, uh, they were two separate interviews, but both of them talked in great detail about the bread making. And so again, taking the notes and being able to use some of their own words to be able to, I think it was on a, um, a DVD, um, but be able to stop and, and write down exactly what they said, that was of enormous benefit to be able to to make sure I was saying that correctly, especially since I had not experienced that um, myself. And I'll go ahead and share the excerpt of Sherry's description of that process uh, from the book. Muti baked rye bread at least one uh, once a week for our family. And this was a task our mother took very seriously. Papa grew the rye and then took it out of one of the out to one of the mills in town to grind into flour. She would feed the bread starter the night before. Early the next morning, Muti would get up and mix the dough in a great big wooden trough, which Horst described as humongous. She used about two thirds of rye flour and about one third wheat flour. After mixing the dough, she would work in the yeast. Once ready, Muti would shape the soft dough into 10 to 12 individual loaves, setting them a, a, set, setting them a small space apart atop the wooden kitchen table and leaving them to rise for at least three to four hours. Each loaf was probably about 10 to 15 inches long. When I was a little girl, they always looked so big to me. The kitchen was in a building separate from the main house. A vast brick oven was built out through the back wall of the kitchen. 
An iron door about three feet square allowed access from the interior of the kitchen while sealing off the heat within. Mutti mainly used pine branches to fuel the oven. As the dough rose the morning of bread baking day, the fire in the oven would be stoked and left to get hot. Mutti used a long handled wooden paddle to place bread in and remove it from the oven. This tool was about five feet long from handle to the broad end, allowing her to put food in the oven without getting burned. Mutti thought the oven temperature was right. When Mutti thought the oven temperature was right, she would get a piece of wheat straw and place it in a crack in the wooden paddle surface. After opening the door of the oven, she would extend the paddle inside. Mutti would move the paddle around, making slow horizontal circles with the larger end of the oversized utensil. When that wheat straw turned brown and the burning wood glowed pale, glowed a pale white, she knew the oven was ready. Plump loaves of dough would be placed one by one atop the plank of the spatula and then fed into the oven's brick cooking surface. The interior of the oven was large enough to cook all the loaves at one time. Mutti, the consummate culinary expert, always knew when the bread was ready to take out. Once the loaves were baked, our mother would take them out to a little bench on a porch. Each loaf would cool propped against the wall. Once the rye bread was cooled, they were placed on a shelf of the wooden storage cupboard in the kitchen and covered with hand towels. How wonderful that rye bread made our house smell. After the first loaf came out and was cooled, Horse and I would get to cut off an end. We would put some butter or honey on it and eat it. That was the biggest treat we had. Both Horse and I agreed that the smell of fresh baked bread was our favorite memory of our mother's cooking. It was particularly appetizing when we got home from school on a day when Mutti had baked bread. Oh, remarkable passage. I can, I can almost, I can smell the kitchen. <laughs> now, Susan, as, as we read the book, uh, your, your mother uh, had a very resilient uh, spirit. To what did she uh, attribute her ability to keep going through the, the hard times? Well, she gives a lot of credit to her mother. Her mother's, of course, the name, the word Mutti is the name for mother in German. So we all called my grandmother and her mother Mutti, but her real name was Anna Gerlach Schindler. And we, Mutti was a quiet woman, wise, strong, and creative. And she worked hard to keep the family together, especially when they were driven out of their farm home. My mother would tell you that her, she believes that, that uh, God gave her the determination and chutzpah to get through all of the difficult experiences that she went through. But I've got another reading. Uh, it's an example in the book of how Mutti kept my mother safe when they were refugees. Just describes Mutti's creativity. And this was when they were refugees. Uh, Russian soldiers thinned out our group every few days and either took men like they had taken Papa and Kurt to work in, a la in labor camps or on building projects or took women to work in laundry camps. I was afraid the soldiers would take my mother and brother from me and that I would be all by myself. Young men close to horse age were also occasionally dragged out of our column and given a gun. They then marched off to accompany the Russian soldiers on some task, possibly even forced to fight against the German army. The soldiers' attention to horse seemed to have waned, at least for the moment. 
keeping her only daughter under wraps was going to be a little bit more difficult for Muti. Each morning, she would begin her menstruations of disguise, a makeup job that would have made any theatrical company green with envy. My cheeks were rosy, so Muti would pat flour all over my face to make me look pale and sickly. Then she would rub lard on my neck. Once all the grease was applied, she would wrap a rag around my neck. The saturated cloth coupled with the lard's rancid smell gave my neck the appearance that there was some sort of rash or wound there. By the time Muti finished fastening the length of fabric around my neck, I could not even turn my head. I was sitting there with a stiff neck. The soldiers would look at me and pass by. I have wondered many times if I could have done that for my girls. My mother was 47 in the spring of 1945. Muti's demure belied the iron will that lie within. Early each morning, the soldiers would wake us up and have us on the march soon afterwards. We probably walked several kilometers each day. They would commandeer some poor farmer's barn as a place for our bedraggled party to sleep out of the night air. Muti was ever mindful of the wolfish intentions of our Russian hosts. On nights when a pile of hay served as our mattress, she would create a nest for me, concealing me within the hay. Muti and several other women would then sleep over me. My Muti loved horse, horse and me with a fierce love that gave her courage in these impossible days. Her disguises for me seemed to be working perfectly, but the situation we all found ourselves in was far from perfect. One morning, the Russians came looking for laundry workers earlier than expected. Unfortunately, Muti had not yet had a chance to camouflage me. Before we knew what was happening, a soldier stepped forward and grabbed my arm. With a rough jerk, he pulled me towards him where I was standing. You come, he growled, nodding in the direction of a frightened group of girls, women, and men gathered nearby. Muti, Horst, and I stared at each other across the space between us. It may as well have been the distance to the moon. Our eyes telegraphed silent messages of love, our hearts burning within us at the injustice of it all. My worst fear was losing my family. As the soldiers led me away, I did not know if I would ever see my mother and brother again. Papa had been gone more than 10 days and now I was being carted off to God knows where by the Red Army. Muti sobbed as I clambered up into the bed of a wagon and plopped down beside another young girl that looked to be about my age. There were probably close to 15 young women and ladies taken with me. Most were teens, but a few of them were mothers. Their young children pitifully crying as they were left behind. I knew none of the female females taken except one, a female cousin of mine, 10 years older, who also somehow in the, was in the wagon with me. Although she did not live in Radach, she may have been living in a nearby town with her parents. She was married, but her husband, a soldier in the Wehrmacht, had been away. The Russians also took about 10 men probably required to turn the cranks on the laundry machines. The soldiers explained that we would be taken 20 kilometers away, which is about 12 miles, and would only be there for three days. A chill ran down my spine. That is what they told Papa too. He would only be gone from us for three days. As the harness leathers cracked over the backs of the horses hitched to our wagon, a great sense of foreboding washed over me. With my every backward glance, my mother, brother, and all the people taken 
with us grew smaller and smaller. In front of me lie an uncertain future. Throughout the, the story, your, your mother encountered three different uh, military the uh, the Russians, the Poles, and the Nazis. Which were the the ones that were the most difficult to deal with? Well, mother believes that the Russians were absolutely the worst, and perhaps it's because they were the first ones who invaded the farm and forced the family to leave. She remembers how mean they were, um, how big the soldiers were. They had to duck their heads to get through the, the farm building doorways. And she even remembers the smallpox scars on the faces of the young soldiers. Uh, those faces are embedded in her memory banks to this day. She remembers the caps with the red stars and she will never forget the injustices carried out by the Russians to her family and to the people of her village. They shot the chickens and turkeys. They spilled molasses that my grandmother had painstakingly made all over the steps and tore a down mattress and threw the feathers on the molasses, made a huge mess and just ruined a lot of things that, that were valuable on the farm. She also remembers the, the soldiers being drunk. So, you know, she encountered the, not, the German Nazis, the, the Pol, Pols, Polish soldiers and the Russians, but she says the Russians were the worst. Turning to uh, a little uh, more positive uh, experiences for your mother, but what did, did she kind of feel was a, a defining moment uh, in in her in her life in her character development? Well, I don't know if this is a, a defining moment, but um, you know, she she had such a resilient spirit, and she was the firstborn. She could be defiant. But uh, I have a, another short reading and it, that, that shows an example of her grit and determination uh, after she had been taken to the, to the labor camp. Each morning we would line up in a long line. A female soldier would walk down the line in front of us and say, you and you and you wash. Those of us who, who she had pointed to would have to go to the laundry line. On the fourth day of wash duty, a Russian female officer barked orders in front of us. She wore a winter cap with ear flaps to be tied up over the top of the head. I can still see the red star of the Russian army emblazoned on the front of her hat. Now, when I see one of those caps, I want to throw it away. I never allowed my boys to have one because all I see is Russians in my mind. I do not have anything good to say about the Russians. We did not like the Nazis, but we really did not like the Russians. When she pointed to me, I stepped out of the line, held out my hands and said to her in German, look at my hands. Rubbing against the edge of the hard washboards wore off almost all the skin on my hands. They were red and bloody. I shook my head from side to side, making my no emphatic. I knew if I refused to obey an order, the female officer in charge would shoot me. But I did not care. I looked at her defiantly and thought to myself, I don't know if my mother or brother is still alive. My dad is gone. You don't even know my name. What's the difference? Go ahead and shoot me. Once again, God protected me. The female officer pushed me back in line and took the next girl. Her hands looked as bad as mine, but she did not say anything. I think that that story just exemplifies my mom's uh, spirit of um, grit and determination and defiance uh, in in that moment, and she believes God did protect her 
in many moments like that throughout the whole story. It's just a sequence of miracles. Well, one of the, I guess you might be able to say it's, it's a miracle, but she eventually immigrates back to the United States. But as you'd mentioned earlier, when she uh, and her family went to Germany, she was only six months old. So she's now grown up in Germany, speaks German, but now is back in the United States. How did she make the adjustment to, to be back in the U.S. and to, to start a new life? Well, she was lucky enough to have relatives live over here who had been in Germany and spoke German. So she came over and lived with her aunt, uh, her father's sister, and uh, the man that her her father had worked for on a farm in America before he he returned to to Germany. But she really wanted to learn English. Uh, but it was it was difficult. Uh, she thought she was too old to go to school. So uh, she was able to get her aunt helped her get a job in a hospital in a diet kitchen where she could work without speaking any English. Um, one of the nurses there, as it turns out, spoke German and had attended a small high school in a German community not too far away where she thought mom could get extra help. Uh, needed uh, to acclimate to a uh, new language in a new land and perhaps go to high school there. So that was all arranged and mom moved in with a, a family in the small farming German farming community and started attending high school at age 18. And it was very hard in the beginning. She was so frustrated every day because it was, you know, all, all the words were foreign to her. She didn't understand English. She she came home from school and she was ready to quit. But with the help of the family she lived with, she persevered and was ready to get up the next morning and go try again. So again, that's just a, a testament to her her resilient spirit. We can see her in, in this picture in the uh, in a gym class, right? Yes. Now, uh, point out which one she is. She's the, the second one from the right on top. Sherry, what was your, your favorite part of, of this uh, entire project? I'd have to say really that meeting Mildred <laughs> was the was really really the highlight um she's just an incredible lady and susan said she is in fast um remarkable shape um for her age she can she's like the energizer bunny she can run circles around anybody that i know but you know as i've gotten to know her but also study her life story she's really just become a role model for me in many ways and so it was really easy to to write about somebody that um, seems like from the very first moment that I met her, it's like we just known each other all our lives. And um, and then those five days in Kansas were just so very special, um, getting to be in the Jansen home and in the home homes of other um, extended family members. Jean, uh, my dear friend, Mildred's cousin, hosted me and I got to stay with her and her son Brock and that was just so very special. But those memories sort of provided fuel for my pen and inspired me to try to tell her story faithfully and well. But, you know, Mildred's story really at the, the heart of it is one of overcoming incredible odds and not only surviving, but going on to live well, a life filled with love and laughter and with great joy. And who doesn't love a story like that? <laughs> well, it's true. Susan, uh, what were some of your mom's experiences uh, post high school? Um, she had she had a very, very uh, uh, incredible life uh, as uh, she acclimated to uh, being a US citizen. She did, and when she was a senior in high school, um, she was dating my dad, and they got engaged and married. And you know, she was so excited to be to be uh, in love and and starting a family. You know, um, after they got married, and she was still missing her 
her mother and brother who were still over in Germany. They were trying to to everything they could to get them over. And uh, finally, after seven long years, they were able to come over. So that was probably a, a highlight on this. probably a, a highlight for her and front of the book is a picture down on the on the bottom of of in seven years at the train but, uh, it was really that was her, to get them back in her life and to have them um, in the united states to be free with her now uh sherry uh with the book uh, you also, uh, and I'm sure she would say the highlights. Okay, I think we're just Sorry. having a little little audio problem there, there, Susan. It's okay. Um, I was just going to to say, uh, uh, Sherry, with the, with the book, you had the honor of of writing it, but it's also received uh, several awards as well. It has. Um, Susan and I received word in early January of this year that the book was selected as a Sunny Award winner by our publisher, Sunbury Press, um, for 2020. Um, Sunbury at the time had eight imprints. I think they're up to 12, but we won this award for the Sunbury Press imprint. Um, this company receives over a thousand proposals each year and publishes 50 to 70 books annually so we were again very honored to be in that company um, but winners kind of their description is winners aren't always necessarily top in sales but are the books that had the biggest impact for their reach and um, we just Lawrence Nor, the publisher and everybody on the team at Sunbury Press has been wonderful to work with also Mildred was um, notified in early August that she is the recipient of this year's Medal of Honor which is given by the National Society of the Daughters of the American Revolution um, and this is a very prestigious award um, given to native-born American citizens and a local chapter the Smoky Hill DAR chapter um, in the Ellsworth area nominated her but these individuals that received this award have made unique and lasting contributions to American heritage by giving of themselves um, in service to their community and their fellow man and so um, at the end of this month Mildred will receive that medal there'll be a, a special ceremony for her and uh, my husband and I are traveling to Kansas and we'll look so forward to being with them and then about three weeks ago, I found out that um, I've been selected to receive the Mississippi Author of the Year Award for Nonfiction by the Mississippi Library Association and, um, for Mildred's story. And so, again, very honored for that. And um, that will be we'll do a virtual convention. Everybody is having to, you know, again, uh, make adjustments in this COVID season, but at the, at the MLA's. Um, annual convention, but we're just, we're very grateful um, that others have found it noteworthy. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Um, as uh, for the both of you, uh, have there been any surprises or uh, interesting stories of, of people who have read the book and, and reacted to it? There have been. Um, Susan and I and Mildred, all of her family have just been very pleasantly surprised, really overwhelmed by the very positive and the endearing responses that we've received um, from the very beginning of this project. When Susan and I started talking, I feel like this was a really good story. And there were a lot of people that I would talk to in publishing that would just say, I don't want you to get your hopes up. I'm sure this is a really nice lady and this is a great little story and you can do, you know, do your best job. But People don't know you and they don't know her and you're probably not going to find a publisher. And I would again think this is a really good story. So anyway, that's been fun. As I mentioned earlier, um, Ken Geyer wrote the foreword and he is a New York Times bestselling author. And so some of his words were just really um, dear in the end of that. And he, he writes at 91, Milder Schindler Jansen has given us a time capsule of that war in the years following it filled with pristinely preserved memories of a bygone era. 
that time capsule was entrusted to Sherry Green, who impacted each memory with white gloved reverence. She examined each photograph, each letter, each bit of memorabilia, corroborating them with historical accounts and the testimonies of others. She has painstakingly pieced together those remnants of Mildred's life to form a compelling memoir. I commend both for the legacy they have left us, and I recommend it to you, the reader, to inspire the legacy you will one day leave to those you love. And then another one of the most meaningful notes, um, I had spoken to a book club here in Jackson, Mississippi, where I live earlier this summer, but one of those members had written another member and they had sent it on to me. Um, but this sweet lady just wrote, she said, I can't even tell you how grateful I am for your recommending surviving Hitler evading Stalin. I started reading it this afternoon and I'm not quite finished yet. Mildred Jansen's story through Sherry Green's work is a beautiful testimony. I've cried, praise God, so many times today while reading. Thank you so much for telling me about this book. I'm already recommending it to others. Really, everyone should read it. And I, I think, you know, again, when you sit down and um, try to mark the success um, of a book, you know, I'd be less than honest with you if I didn't tell you that that I don't care about sales figures or the number of Amazon reviews or how many likes that we receive on our Facebook pages. But really, at the end of the day, I don't have any control over those markers. And I've just really had to put a governor on myself that I don't spend a lot of emotional or mental time thinking about those quantifiers because it would be really easy to get bent out of shape about it when they don't give the results. But what I have chosen to focus on is the power of Mildred's story. And although there are a lot of people that may read this book that have never been in a war, every human goes through dark days. All of us do. Um, and Mildred's story is a very transformative story and the power of God in one's life. Um, anyway, and just that suffering is a universal thing. But, you know, every time that I read or hear a word about how Mildred's story has encouraged or inspired a reader, then, then our book has achieved it. Well, and I'll just add that the, the most common comment that I've heard, and we hear this a lot, is, oh, I started reading it and I just couldn't put it down. So that's, that's really uh, encouraging that it's so engaging that people want to want to keep reading it into the night and all the way through. Um, we were at a book signing and a psychologist told us that he's prescribing mom's memoir to his clients because he feels like it will help them understand that they can persevere through difficult circumstances and come out with a great life and a positive attitude. So I thought that that was neat as well. Uh, and we have some uh, questions that have been uh, coming in from the audience. Uh, if you're, you're watching tonight on any of the platforms, you have a, a question, just go ahead and either type it into the chat box if you're on GoToWebinar or in the uh, comment section on YouTube or Facebook. And we'll, we'll, we've got some time here to answer some questions. Um, we'll just take a look at, at a few here. Um, Sherry, as a teacher, uh, what do you think students can take away from uh, reading history uh, like this? I think one of the things is that um, history really is a story about stories that happen to real life people. I think it's real easy to be a 13 or 14 year old in a classroom and think this was one of the most common comments I always got. Why do I need to know about dates and these people are dead and why, what does, why is this relevant to my life? Um, but these were real live people. Um, and also that I think there are a lot of myths of every historical period. That was one of the things I appreciated the most, one of the things that intrigued me about Mildred's story. I think it is very common to think that every German citizen that lived under the regime of Adolf Hitler fell into lockstep with his ideology and they did not, they did not. I think a lot of them, like Mildred's family, lived in fear for their lives and just were good, honest, hardworking people and trying to get through their life in a horrible situation. But um, 
and also to show that in spite of horrific circumstances that you can persevere. And then also I think too in terms of history, if you don't know where you have come from, it's kind of hard to know where you're going. Um, is there, uh, Susan, there any uh, stories that your mom uh, has of uh, aircraft uh, being in, in part of the story? Obviously, as the uh, commemorative Air Force, uh, a lot of our audience is uh, very uh, up on, on aircraft, but were there any passengers or stories that, that resonated with, uh, with aircraft in, in her experience? Yes, they uh, heard the aircraft going over there their uh, little farm many times and I, I'll read a short excerpt here about the planes flying overhead. By the fall of 1944, more and more allied bombers were fly, flying over our farm. We could sometimes see them, although we were not worried about them. They were going to Berlin. To avoid being identified, planes flew over rural areas. Gesturing up to the sky, Papa would point out the bombers as they flew over. Here they're coming, here come the Americans, he would say. I remember the planes made a dull, roaring sound. They were going, woo, 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 very much like the sound of a thrashing machine. It would not be until years later that I learned that other allied planes flying over our farm sounded differently because they, their payload had already been delivered. Marie, one of Papa's sisters who lived in Berlin and who was known affectionately as Tanta Mariechen, would occasionally come for a visit. We would sometimes hear bombers in the air nearby while she was with us and inevitably the subject of air raids would come up. Tanta Marichin would say to Horst and me, I need to take you children home with me for one week and let you find out what we go through every night when we have to go down in the shelters. She and every other Berliner were wary by this time after experiencing Allied bombing raids for over four years. By the time spring of 1945, the tide of war had turned against Germany. No one knew for sure, but rumors about a possible Russian invasion swirled all around us. Well, we know how that turned out. But yeah, that's that's her memory of seeing the, the planes fly over uh, all the time, daily, they would fly. And it, it is amazing, uh, <laughs> it being in, in the United States, we didn't have that same experience of, of actually living the war. It was something that's happening in Europe and in the Pacific uh, where your mother and all of those who were in Europe actually were a part of it, whether they were uh, involved, actively involved, or just uh, in, in the citizenry, uh, just being in the wrong place at the wrong time, as it were. Um, what uh, what was the, the uh, your mom's hometown uh, in, in Germany? <laughs> The name of the town was Radach, R-A-D-A-C-H, and uh, it is now Poland. So the name of it now is Radachow, R-A-D-A-C-H-O-W. They added okay. the O-W on the end when uh, they they changed the line and and they drove my mom's family out a second time. They were able to find their way home after the Russians drove them out and they experienced all those horrors being refugees and then they got back home and then the Poles came and said this is our land and you're either going to learn to speak Polish and become a Pole or you're going to leave and Pole Town decided to leave except for one family that was Polish. Wow. Uh, let's see, uh, from a viewer, uh, my grandparents survived the Holocaust. For instance, my grandmother always made way too much food, and if you didn't eat it, we'd all be in trouble. <laughs> Do you think that there are traits uh, that the people who survived this time period uh, have in common? I do because there were days and days when they were refugees and they had no food. And when my mom was released from the, the labor camp, the laundry camp, uh, 
with several other girls. They were trying to figure out what way they came from. They didn't eat for days because they were on the road trying to find their way back to their families. And miraculously, my mom found her, her mother and brother. Uh, another God thing, uh, another one of those sequence of miracles that, that just are incredible, an incredible part of this story. But yes, uh, we have always had bountiful food. We, we were trained to only take what we would eat. And if there was, you know, half a serving of something left in one of the serving bowls, we would save it because we do not waste food because there were so many days when they had no food. And Sherry, you were nodding, nodding your, your head in agreement as well. Any, any thoughts on, on that subject? Um, being with Mildred in her home, I mean, I, I've seen her, helped her clean up the dishes after a meal and so witness that. But I've also had the privilege to know several other World War II survivors um, and talk to them in detail or write articles, not books, but articles about them. And that same, um, I think, just reverence for life and appreciation, but also not taking anything for granted nor being being wasteful of whatever life had given you. Uh, it was very common. Well, great. We are just about out of time, but I'd, I'd like to uh, give you both an opportunity if there's anything we've missed or any, any final thoughts you have before we sign off tonight. We just thank there you was. for the opportunity to, to share, share this story um, and hope your readers will be encouraged by it. Well, I'd like to share one little tidbit that uh, we learned from a World War II museum educator that this is the first and only known testimony of an abduction by Russian soldiers. Uh, apparently, uh, that that's you know it's it's usually uh, Nazis or or other soldiers, but this is this is a the story is unique in that uh, there aren't any other accounts of of Russians taking taking citizens. So uh, it's it's unique in many ways, but uh, that that was really surprising to hear. So, and and we want to thank your viewers and thank you for hosting the program and and featuring Mom's memoir. Great. And of course, the most important thing is if uh, someone would like a, a copy of the book, how's the best way to go about uh, getting it? And uh, one of the questions was, is it possible to get a signed copy of the book? We have book plates um, that that we can send if we can get folks addresses. Uh, actually, there's a there's a Facebook page and um, if you message me on on the book's Facebook page, uh, I I will be happy to send uh, a signed uh, book plate along. And you can buy the book at Sunbury Press. Uh, on the screen there, you can see SunburyPress.com, Amazon.com, any really any anywhere you can buy books. Uh, the audio books are available on Audible, which is uh, through Amazon. And um, so they're they're out there. They're available. A bookstore, any bookstore could order it. So it's, it's worth reading. There you go. It is it is definitely worth reading. And uh, I want to thank you both for uh, spending uh, some time with us uh, this evening. And uh, to those of you watching, uh, thank you for uh, for sticking around for another Warbird Tube webinar. We'll be back uh, next Wednesday night. If you have any uh, thoughts on uh, interesting people you'd like us to uh, talk to or, or uh, subjects that you think we should cover, please drop Leah Block an uh, email at media at cafhq.org. I'm your host, Steve Bush. Thanks again for being with us. And uh, thank you to uh, Susan and uh, Sherry for uh, for being here go out and, and buy the book enjoy it you will uh, you will enjoy reading a Mildred story and again for the commemorative Air Force I'm Steve Bush have a great night thank you